Positive flight attitude, that means a couple of different things. You know, positive flight attitude in terms of keeping the airplane in a positive flight attitude and upright, but also keeping your attitude in the appropriate place to do that. So, you know, we all hear about situational awareness, and it's kind of like being told to be safe. How do you do that? It sounds really good, but, you know, telling me to be safe and telling me, uh, you know, that I don't know exactly what to do in order to do that. And I, I was thinking about it because situational awareness is part of, it goes with the theme of this year's safety stand down, which is don't be surprised, be prepared. And being prepared in means keeping, making sure that your situational awareness is right. And so, I, you know, I sat down and thought about what does that mean and what do, what do we do? How do we actually keep track of, of what our situational awareness is? You're probably familiar with the FA safety team's perceive, process, and perform. And I think of that as perceive what is it doing, whatever it happens to be. The process part is always the tough one for, for most of us because if we, if we know what it is and we understand what it's about, then we know what to do about it, which is the next part. But this is the what can it, whatever it happens to be, what can it do to me? And then the last part is perform. What can I do to be safe and to make sure that, me, that my passengers and I are all safe? And uh, because uh, the theme of this was awareness, um, and uh, I know that there are a lot of acronyms floating around in aviation, so I decided, why don't I make up another one? And you don't have to remember it this way, but uh, it, was, it was at least uh, a device for presentational purposes. So, um, and by the way, please don't tell this guy, he's a, he's a CAP friend of mine, and I snapped his picture, and he has no idea he's being used in this. So um, uh, let's just keep that a little secret. Uh, the first part of AWARE is your aircraft, and we'll talk about that. Second part is weather. That's a big one for all of us, and I think that's one of the toughest things for a lot of pilots to, to deal with. How is it that we look at, think about, deal with weather? And it's something I've put a lot of time and thought into. Uh, the next part is airspace, and we all know that we have some very complicated airspace in this country nowadays, and even if you live in uncomplicated airspace, you never know when a uh, temporary flight restriction is going to come up, and so there's a lot to be aware of there. The next one is reality. What's it really doing as opposed to what we would like for it to be doing? So we'll, look, we'll take a look at that. And then finally, external pressures. I think this is the most insidious one of all because we are all pushed along a lot of times by things we just don't we, we aren't consciously aware of, we just know that we're feeling some pressure to do something. So let's, let's get right into the um, aircraft. Um, what, the, these are some of the things that I think you need to be aware of with respect to your airplane. What is its mechanical condition? Now, that means airworthiness, and uh, can somebody tell me what does airworthy mean? What does airworthy mean? Go. It's fit to fly, that's right. There's, there's an official um, designation that it, it's in conformance with its type certificate, but also that it is in a condition for safe flight. And one of the things that I use, another acronym, you've seen this one, I didn't make this one up, uh, Aviate, um, the annual inspection and the, uh, any airworthiness directives, VOR check if that's required. The, the little I there is actually a one for 100 hour if it's used for higher flight instruction. Then you have um, the altimeter and pedostatic system check, the transponder and the ELT. And that's one of the little things that I use to, to go through and see if the airplane uh, is legally in condition um, for to go. Um, as far as in condition for safe flight, now, once you got, you're got, you sure that all the paperwork is there, it's still not necessarily in condition for safe flight. And let me give you a little example. One day I had a student and we checked before he went out to pre-flight the airplane, we checked to make sure that all of these, you know, aviate, everything was there, all the, 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 the airplane as far as the paperwork was concerned was perfectly legal to fly. So I sent him out to do his pre-flight in the Cessna 152 and I, I watched from a safe distance. He didn't know I was watching, but I always do. Uh, so I, he, I watched him uh, do his pre-flight, and then I walked out there when it looked like he was about ready. And as I was approaching, I said, so how's the airplane? He said, it's, it's fine, the oil's a little low. I said, what, define a little low? He said, four quarts. 
well, is that good for Cessna 152? Because I'm you know, always asking questions. He said, yes. And for pattern work, that was, that was a perfectly fine answer. So I walk around to my side of the airplane, and as I'm walking around, the nose gear fairing was covered with oil, fresh oil. And it was dripping down. I could see it dripping down. And I said, uh, what about that? Oh, yeah, I was wondering about that. He says, ah, OK, remedial pre-flight. Uh, it was good to wonder about that. I said, basically, the airplane is bleeding. We don't know why. But we're going to go, we're, it's grounded as of now. Because even though all the paperwork was in order, this airplane, as we found it, was not in a condition for safe flight. So one of the things that I, I would advise you, always approach an airplane with the idea that uh, you know something is going to be wrong and be pleasantly surprised. You be prepared to find something wrong and be surprised if everything is, is actually in good shape. Um, and that's part. That's one of the reasons we do a pre-flight. Now, if you have ever done a pre-flight where it's the kind that you just sort of phone it in, I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but you know if you've maybe been in a hurry and maybe you just did the things a little bit more quickly than you should have and maybe you just kind of went around, well, that's the sort of thing they'll get you in trouble because those are, if your mindset is such that you're not prepared to do a good, solid pre-flight, then maybe you're going to miss some things. Um, in flight, uh, one of the things I wanted to say about in flight is, OK, you're flying along. And how, how many people fly airplanes that, you know, it's it, whether you own or rent, it's usually a pretty typical range of airplanes that, that you fly. I mean, I know I do. I have my club's airplane, and there are certain ones that I rent from time to time. You kind of know what to expect from those airplanes. They sound a certain way, and they, the, the gauges are going to read a certain way. And what do you do if something is off? Well, that's when you should start paying attention to a lot of other things. It's not a neat and there's, there's never a good time to panic in an airplane. Panic is very unseemly, and it won't get you where you need to go. But the, the time to really be paying attention is if you are flying an airplane and, and something doesn't look quite right or feel quite right or sound quite right, start looking a little bit harder for what's there. That's part of the situational awareness that we're talking about. And then post-flight, OK, you're done. You know, you've tied down the airplane, everything's fine. But we're, we're all taught, I hope, to, at the, at, at, after you've finished a flight, go around and look at everything again. Make sure that uh, it's one way to make sure that you haven't left any lights on, one way to make sure that all three tie downs are on. I found planes with one or two before because somebody got in a hurry. But it's also a, a time to check and see if there's anything that looks like it needs attention before the next flight. So all of these things are about being very much aware of your airplane. It's legal condition and it's fitness to fly. And, you know, the, um, I, I like, uh, it, this sounds like a Vulcan word, a Klingon word, TLR, uh, but that looks about right. I mean, but you could also say that sounds about right. And I'm not suggesting, you know, I call this the science of situational awareness, but there's also an art to it. And I, I preach a lot about paying attention to the feelings that you have. If you have a gut feeling that something's just not right, start looking a little bit harder to see what is or isn't right. Another part of airplanes, especially now, are systems. How many fly something G glass? G1000, others? Yep. Some? Yeah, there, there's some great stuff out there. But uh, you, you, so you, need to, you always need to understand the basic instruments and especially the automation. Now, with automation, one of the things that I've, um, I, I kind of like to think about it is there are three skills involved in it. Information management, this, these, are, these airplanes are like Burger King, have it your way. You can put everything on the screen in exactly what order you want, and you're perfectly entitled to do that. Do what works for you. I like heading up. I get in airplanes and somebody's got north up, well, you know, I go change the keys and I fix it the way that, that I want it and the way that I'm comfortable with flying. But information management also means knowing what kind of information that you need to have on the screen for any given phase of flight. Um, sometimes, and I have certain screens set up the way that, that I like them. Um, there's one with a flight plan where I can see a split view between text and the moving map. Um, it, but information management is what do you need to know right now? It's also, there's lots of information in these things. 
And you need to know how to get to whatever it is that you need to get to with a couple of keystrokes. Um, second is automation management. Um, I'm not talking about just the autopilot, although the what's it doing now is a famous question that uh, if, if you have to ask what's it doing now, it's time to shut it off and make sure that you know what it's doing and then you can re-engage the autopilot. But automation ma management is also knowing what the systems will automatically do for you and knowing um, as well what you have to manually do. And I've been surprised more than once, you know, if I've gone between systems, um, Avidyne did it one way, Garmin did it the other way, and I was in one and expecting it to behave like the other, and I, yeah, I got surprised. I got what we call automation surprise. Um, so automation management is, is being aware of what mode you're in. Is it flight director or autopilot, or am I in not any mode at all? What am I expecting it to do? And if it's doing something that you don't expect it to do, that's the time to turn off the automation and go back to, some people call it go green, go raw data, whatever. But you don't want the airplane doing things that you don't know about. Um, the next thing is risk management. Just because it looks like an airliner, it's still bolted into a general aviation airplane in, in the case of a lot of what we're flying. And risk management to me involves a, a lot of understanding that, hey, it may look like I've got, and I do have a lot of capability here, but I'm still flying a light general aviation airplane. And I still have a lot, I have still have the limitations that go with that. I mean, there are a ton of things that we can do, but we just need to make sure that we're aware and constantly aware that this cannot do everything for us. Um, and we can't, we, the, the gadgets can't make up for just the basic limitations of the airplane. Now we're gonna look at weather. Um, and this is, this is one of my favorite parts, mostly because weather was one of the most challenging things for me to learn. I went, like everybody else in here in ground school, I went through all the weather theory. I went through all the weather code, which I admit I like. Um, but, I, and at the, when I got my instrument rating, I remember thinking, okay, now what? What do I do with this? You know, I, I didn't really have a framework to think about it. And this is, some, this is helpful. What is the weather doing? What can it do to me? And then what can I do to be safe? And I always think that if you have the first part, uh, it's, it's that second part, the processing, what can it do to me? that if we know that, then, then we're in a much better position to perform and know what we can do to be safe. And uh, by the way, I hope we all know that we're not gonna go flying anything in weather that looks like uh, what's on the screen there. Thunderstorms or bad news, no matter what. Okay, where do I start? When I, when I first started flying, uh, we still had a flight service station that I could walk to next door, and, and the, I would ask for a printout in the days when you ask for a printout instead of using your iPad and for flight and all the other cool stuff that we have now. And they would give me this stack of paper. And I would remember, I would, and, it, and you know, you start going through it and it looks like what's on uh, the code there. And I would sit there and look at it and I felt like my Cocker Spaniel looking at a clock. And, huh? What is this? What do I do with this? And it's not that I hadn't been taught. I knew how to read it, but now what do I do with it? Uh, how do I make sense of this? And so I, I eventually came up with a framework, and it, I didn't come up with it all by myself, thanks to uh, Ralph Buck's book about the weather. If you think about what are the things that weather can do to a pilot, and it can create wind. You're talking about crosswinds and turbulence. Uh, reduce ceiling and visibility, clouds, rain, fog, all the other stuff. And here's the third thing, it can affect aircraft performance. And those are things like high density altitude and icing. So if you can break down whatever the weather is, and first of all, think about which one of these things is it that is gonna be an issue, that starts to, to take that huge stack of paper or the huge stack of electrons, whichever one you have, and it starts to make, uh, to, to give you a way to make sense out of it. Now, um, this is, I put weather code up here, or like I said, I admit I like it, but it was easier to put up here for, uh, for showing here. So if you look at what we can weather do, uh, along the top there is a METAR for my home airport. And if you look at, the way, at the, the way that the information is structured, it really provides you uh, wind, ceiling, and visibility, and performance. And when I say performance, you've got the altimeter setting, but temperature dew point, of course, that bleeds into also ceiling and visibility. But you know, in hot weather, the, the, the high, higher the temperature, that's gonna tell you something about your aircraft performance right there. 
So you can, when you start to get your weather briefing, I would encourage you to start thinking in terms of is it wind, is it ceiling and visibility, or is it performance? Which, which of these things, and it might be two of the three, one of the three, or three of the three, but which of these things is the issue that I need to be prepared to deal with? Uh, know what I can deal with. So when, when wind, when you've got wind, um, there are questions to ask about both the pilot and the airplane. Now let me introduce another concept. I like to think of the pilot and the aircraft as a team. So, you know, I cannot compensate for what the airplane cannot do, and the airplane can't compensate for what I can't do. We have to work together. And if I'm flying a Cub, or if I'm flying a Cessna 152, what that team can do is different than what I can do if I'm flying, say, a Piper Aztec. That's or, or a 182, or if I'm flying steam gauges versus glass, or if I have weather uh, versus if I have weather data link or not, those are all things that they're involved. So when it comes to uh, to wind conditions, I I tend to think of that as an issue where you have to ask questions about the pilot's capabilities and the airplane's capabilities. The pilot, and for me, that's okay. So how good am I? If you have, a, if your airplane has, let's say it has a 15 knot maximum demonstrated crosswind component, that's gonna be a pretty fair amount of wind to get to that crosswind component. Does that mean you can't go? What is the, is the crosswind maximum demonstrated crosswind a limitation? No, it's not, yeah, uh, that, that is correct. It's not, but on the other hand, consider that that number was derived by a test pilot in ideal conditions, you know, and by ideal, I mean very uh, control conditions. And this is the part I always like the best. That test pilot is simulating average pilot skills. Now, I like to think I'm good, but I'm not convinced that I, 